<clears throat> All right. Well, why don't we get started? <clears throat> this is the first day of the conference, so of course, you know, working through <laughs> the glitches <laughs> that are inevitable with uh, our first ever Zoom meeting, um, including my cat trying to scratch down my door. <laughs> So <laughs> the things we deal with in this new world. Um, yes, if everyone could please mute themselves um, during the uh, presentations, that would be really helpful. And then once we get to Q&A, if you're going to be asking a question, then of course you can unmute yourself, but otherwise um, it will create a lot of chaos for us in the background. So please do keep yourself muted. Um, so I want to go ahead and just welcome everybody. Good afternoon. So glad that you're joining uh, this year's Home Care Cooperative Conference. Uh, very excited to have everybody here. Um, and I'm excited to introduce my colleague, Jonathan Ward, who's going to be leading this presentation and discussion. Uh, Jonathan is the Director of Lending at the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning. Um, in this role, Jonathan manages the fund's lending and outreach work connecting with borrowers and helping them transform their ideas into strong lending opportunities that will grow and strengthen individual cooperatives and the larger cooperative sector. Um, prior to stepping into this current role, Jonathan led the Employee Ownership Conversions Program at the ICA Group for about five years, um, assisting dozens of companies with their ownership transitions, including engaging and training with new members. Um, and anyone who's ever heard Jonathan speak will know that he's definitely a trainer at heart um, and loves uh, working with people and is really amazing at conveying complex information and building shared understanding. So it's great to have him bring that, that experience and, and lens to his new role. Um, Jonathan earned an MBA and a Master of Public Policy and Administration from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and a BS in information design and corporate communication from Bentley University. So welcome to Jonathan. And just before I turn it over, I'll just also introduce Ivona Machuk, who's a senior consultant at the ICA group and will be leading our um, Q&A portion um, after Jonathan's presentation. So please do um, include your questions in the chat and uh, those will be captured and, um, and, and can be, um, addressed at the end. Um, we'll also, I think in the smaller group, have some opportunity for some live questions as well, but we'll start using the chat just to keep things uh, fairly organized. So thank you everyone and welcome. And Jonathan, you've got the floor. Great. Thank you very much, Katrina. It's very nice. And it's great to be back at the Home Care Conference. I think this is the third conference I've been to. So unfortunately, I've missed a couple over the years, but it's great to be back this year. Uh, see a lot of familiar faces you know, get to talk about, you know, numbers and financials and things again. So really appreciate, you know, you being here and uh, yeah, hopefully we can have a good conversation today about home care financing. We can hear from you, I can share some things and we can do some good Q&A at the end. Um, I think I should share my screen. Is that how it's going to work, team? I'll just share here and leave from my computer. You got it. Let me just do that. Great, how are we looking? Readable? Okay. Looking good. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, all right, great. So again, I'm Jonathan Ward here as Director of Lending uh, from the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about the fund and the ICA group and what we do uh, right before we get into the, the content today. I have one logistical slide to mention. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many folks we have here. It's over 20, it says in the, uh, the box above. So we're gonna be using the chat, of course, for questions and Avona and the team are gonna be watching that. Uh, so if you do have a question during it, a clarifying thing, something you just wanna add to the conversation, you know, right in the beginning, we're gonna be asking about, you know, some ideas of why would your home care co-op take out a loan? So if you wanna participate there, make sure to find that chat thing, you know, and I'm sure you did in the prior one and enter your questions there. And then Avona and anyone else on the team, please, you know, make sure I'm alert of that in case maybe I'm not watching the chat at any given moment. I, you know, full permission to stop me and say there's a question coming up and I'll look forward to that too. All right, great. Now that we got that out of the way. So um, the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning, yes, it's connected to the ISA group. 
Uh, right now, there's the same kind of board of directors over both organizations. So if you've heard of ICA before, um, the fund is really kind of an extension of that, um, a new loan fund that we have to participate in uh, the capital and the financing and the loans um, for co-op, uh, whether that is a business converting to become a cooperative um, or in a home care op uh, cooperative looking to scale and grow. Um, uh, we are, you know, through the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning, now able to participate, you know, in the lending space. So we're really excited to, to be here as an organization. Um, for those of you that don't know, and I think a couple times before when I presented uh, at the Home Care Conference, it was, it was from ICA, and the ICA group um, is one of the oldest co-op developers, you know, in the country. Um, and, you know, of course, has long looked at home care and child care, a lot of the caregiving sectors as, you know, big areas for potential and growth. Uh, in the space. And, and, and so the fund is, you know, kind of came out of an extension uh, of a lot of that work. Um, so what do we do at the fund? Well, two things really. One, uh, we're a lender, a financing partner now. So we're trying to work with all the other financing partners who have kind of carved out and led the way in the space to figure out the right way to complement them, uh, kind of blend the right risk and reward for the different transactions to, you know, bring more co-ops to life and give cooperatives, the financial products and systems they need to, to be successful. So that's one of the things you know, that we're doing. And the other one is just providing advice and guidance uh, in the employee ownership financing space. You know, as Katrina mentioned, I was working with cooperatives you know, for the last five or six years uh, on their business, financial modeling, growth development, you know, and getting a loan comes up along the way. And so it's kind of a unique space with cooperatives and how the ownership is separated, as you well know. And so we like to act as a kind of a consultant and repository for how might you navigate the lending space and put, a, put the capital together for something that you want to do as a co-op, whether it's a line of credit or a growth load or something like that. So a resource for the field as well in finance. Um, real quick, specifically, how, what types of you know, things are we doing? Lines of credit, working capital, you can see that right, uh, right in the middle. Um, uh, and in addition, again, partnering with existing CDFIs and co-op lenders who might be leading the way and, and, and doing a big part of a transaction, but maybe there's a gap there, some piece that, you know, can't be filled uh, in other means. And maybe the workers, you know, have put up as much as they can as the buy-in, but there's still a gap. So how can we come in and fill that gap uh, and complement, you know, what's already there in the system. That's kind of our idea for participating in the bigger loans. And so we're going to invest in projects that have a lot of technical assistance around them, um, you know, teams and support to make sure the, the whole organization is successful. Uh, we're going to invest in projects that are connected with an industry strategy for success and scale, like home care. Uh, makes a lot of sense to kind of double down on certain, you know, industries and be very specific about what financial products they need, you know, instead of kind of being diverse everywhere. So we like that. Um, and then, of course, you know, the social impact, you know, being able to invest in projects for lower income people, uh, you know, people of color, marginalized communities is important as well. All right, so that's about the fund. And I think it's important to know who we are and kind of what the ICA group has done recently. You know, ICA has been around for 40 years. Uh, the fund has been around for one. And so just wanted to provide some context uh, with what's going on there. And, you know, now the information part of it. So this is what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna start off with a quick chat in a second about why might your home care co-op take out a loan, you know, now or in the future. Then we're gonna, kind of do a presentation, you know, it's a community discussion, we're going to get there. First, we're going to do a presentation about, you know, um, different types of money you can take on, debt, equity, and then really diving into loans and saying, well, what is, what are different types of loans? What's a line of credit? What's a term loan? When might I need those to just make sure you can kind of match the needs to the product there? And then we'll think about some specifics, you know, with interest rates and things like that. And then the other half of the presentation, this will be a quicker one, is kind of just the the loan application process. Once you know you have a reason for a loan and you might know what type of product you're looking for, well, how do you get ready and apply for that? Um, you know, there's a lot of great action going on in the other room with home care financials around, you know, planning for that. Um, but I'll touch on it a little bit as well as far as, you know, my position as, you know, a loan officer at the Fund for Jobs Worth Own. And then hopefully we can get into the Q&A and that's really where the community uh, discussion will be. And we can hear, all right, now that you've heard that, 
well, what next? Where are the challenges? Where do you think the missing pieces are? Where's the opportunity? You know, we'll just try to gather and discuss as, as much as we can there. All right, you've heard the preamble, you know where we're going. We're just gonna dive in. So this is the time for the chat. Let's, you know, just take a couple minutes here, think for a second. And this is to provide some flavor. You know, I'm gonna try to reference these examples. Why might, you know, a home care co-op that you're with, your home care co-op, or maybe one that you work with, why might it need to take out a loan? Um, also, we're just trying to collect reasons, you know, giving some specific examples, you know, we're great, take out a loan for this and that. Why? Why might you want to get some more money into the, into the cooperative? And so you can use your chat function to do that. We'll take a few minutes to just type in. And once we feel like we've collected, then we'll, we'll keep going. I think if you're watching my screen, if I bring up the chat too, I get to see what I see. Absolutely, start up, yep. Yeah. To grow, yeah, that like takes an investment, doesn't it? Grow through marketing, yeah, you know, you gotta spend the money to make the money, right? So where's the money to start? Might need a loan. Paying for operations prior to funding, yeah, startup costs, launch costs, right? That, that, that capital that needs to come in to expand employment. Yeah, growth. Maybe that's a new recruitment campaign, gro you know, acquisition, some of growing the business. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of growth and expansion. I like the growth mindset, you know, in here too. And that, that's exactly right. You know, uh, to start up a new office, to acquire a new company, you know, that takes some figuring out, takes some resources to get there. So a loan's a great, a great use to, for that. A global pandemic that brings up, yeah, you know, you got the uncertainty, maybe a line of credit, some type of cushion, uh, you know, one-time events, not being prepared for it. You need to make sure you have something to tap into. So yeah, that's working capital or cushion of some kind. Very relevant. I know a lot of folks have been trying to figure out how to make do with a very unnormal, you know, set of months uh, that, that have happened. Provide more training for employees. Yep, could be a recruitment investment. Um, you know, maybe it's an expensive training program, and you need to have the money. You know, you you don't want to just pay it all out of pocket, so you want to have a loan and then pay back the loan over time. Yep, this is great. Oh, except the pandemic, you know, one. I'll right, we'll just take another second here, but thank you so much just for, you know, talking that story. And I love the examples of, you know, all the growth, you know, whether it's a marketing plan, um, uh, acquiring, you know, a new business that then merges and becomes part of you or setting up a new office, mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. And this is why as a fun too, we like the, you know, the industry specialization, because then we can really have a conversation, you know, with you about growing and acquisition with home care specifically, you know? Uh, and it's great that you all can encourage each other with that growth mindset too. All right, great. So we collected that, I'll minimize this. Thank you so much. We'll have more Q and A at the end with challenges. Um, and if other things come up, uh, Avona and team, maybe just let me know if I'm missing anything on here, I'm gonna shrink it. All right, thanks. So yeah, there's some reasons to, 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 to take out a loan or to, to get investment in or to get some money in or to get some capital in. A lot of synonyms in this space. I'll try to dispel that as we go through. All right. So let's go back here. Got to. All right. Cool. Um, why might you need a loan? So you mentioned a lot of this. I'm just going to go through it and say seven reasons that are kind of summarized from what we got, and then we'll keep going on. So why might you need a loan? One credit history, which really is building a relationship with a bank. <laughs> you might need a loan, kind of counterintuitive, because later you want a bigger loan or later you want a different type of loan and you want a relationship. So that's one reason. Cash advance. This is kind of like the working capital thing where you have money coming in to pay your bills at some point, but it's not here yet. And so you need some type of line of credit or working capital to give you the cash until your revenue turns into cash. That's a cash advance. Yeah. Uh, to finance something. So, you know, buying a piece of equipment, a car, you don't want to just pay for it all up front. You know, you want to pay for it over a number of years, you know, that maybe matches how long you use that, that, that piece of equipment. So financing, that's a very common type of loan. 
peace of mind, global pandemic, you know, you can just sit on a line of credit and not use it. You know, there's some fees attached to that to just maintain it. But yeah, you know, oftentimes, and especially in the last decade, you could kind of say, how are the months going? What's my biggest month, smallest month in terms of maybe extra cash I need? And then you get a wild event that throws everything off, you know, changes the landscape. And then it's like, well, I need a cushion. So peace of mind. Um, the other side, other reasons to grow, certainly mentioned that a lot, and, and growth is really an investment. You, you wanna do something that's going to basically generate profits, but it takes time to generate those profits. So you need to subsidize that, that period to get there. Uh, to refinance, that's another reason to take on a loan. Maybe, maybe you have existing debt, but you wanna get a lower rate or spread it out over more years. Um, and then lastly, uh, maybe to restructure. You know, this is one not associated with, you know, a, a healthy company, but maybe what you found is that your business model, your costs are kind of out of whack and you're not making any money anymore. You have an idea about how to make money again, but you need some time to get there. So you need some resources to restructure and achieve your restructuring plan that you have. I, I'm, I think somebody has their microphone unmuted, so I'm hearing just maybe a little bit of sound, and I'm just pausing for that in case there's a question that might be coming in. Maybe, you know, should go to chat if possible, but. I'm sorry, it might be the interpreter, Fred Svensson here to interpret, but uh, wasn't activated in advance, so it might have been mine, I'll mute. Oh, and thank you for being here to interpret, um, and I'm not sure if it was you, but I just wanted to mention. Um, thanks, Fred. All right, types of financing. So, Let's, you know, we're going to basically talk about loans today, but when we're thinking about financing, bringing money in, right, to the, to the organization, to the cooperative, usually that's a loan, but there's other ways to do it. You know, there have been grants in the last year related to COVID that have come out too. That's a way to bring money into the organization without a promise to repay. Just do all that if you can. But of course, you know, being facetious, that's not always possible. Um, you can also take on equity, right? There's all these different types of things. You know, mostly we're going to be talking about debt today, taking out a loan. This, you know, we'll have a, a contract. It'll be written up how much, you know, you get lent out, how it needs to get repaid. You know, there's going to be an arm's length relationship between the lender doing the loan and the business taking on the capital. You know, that's one way kind of fixed and known and written down. And then on the whole other side of this thing, when we're talking about equity, that's like, well, how about I just own 25% of your company and maybe I just get 25% of the profits. You know, it's basically, it's not a fixed relationship and equity is an ownership stake or some, or, or maybe in the case of royalty financing, maybe I'll give you the money in exchange for owning 3% of all sales you make over time or 1% of all sales you make as my fee. So basically, as you go from you know, debt to equity, the terms of how exactly you get repaid from the lender standpoint get murkier. So an equity investor is gonna want a higher return, maybe a 20% return, where a bank might just want a 5% interest rate. And that's just because it's much more fixed and less risky when you do it as a loan versus equity. So there's a lot of types of way to take on money. And hopefully we can have some great financing sessions about direct public offerings and grants and multi-stakeholder equity investors with co-ops. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to talk about other unique capital things to do as a cooperative. It's a, you know, an entity that definitely needs some time to think about how do you bring on money without giving outsiders voting interests that demutualize and make it undemocratic what we're doing. And so it's tricky when you get outside of this debt spectrum. But we should talk more about that at another time. Today, it's really going to be about debt or loans. I mean, I mean the same thing. But I wanted to give you an idea that whenever you make a deal with somebody, I'll get some of your money in exchange for this. It can be very fixed and bank-like, or it can be much more flexible and equity-like. We're going to be the fixed bank-like today. I'm going to talk about line of credit. And then we're going to talk about a term loan as the two different types of loans that as a business consultant, most of the time I'm talking about accessing financing through one of those different types of products, either a line of credit product, that's great for working capital, you made the money, you know, it's going to come in soon, but it's not here yet. So you need to get the cash to make payroll until the money comes in. Right? 
or I need to buy a bunch of inventory. I'm going to sell it every day, but I place orders by 20,000 a piece. So I need the money. I need to tap into it and then I'll get it back over the next month or so. The money's there. I just don't have the cash yet. That's a line of credit. That's working capital. Um, whenever you're thinking about a working capital loan, the assumption is the company's profitable. It's a timing issue. I need financing because of a timing thing. I need a cushion because I don't know when the next unforeseen expense is going to come. I need a line of credit to tap into because I don't know when my client's going to actually pay me. I invoice them. I don't know when it's going to come in yet, but I'm profitable and the money's going to come. That's kind of the key in getting a line of credit. So if you have timing issues, then you'll kind of turn here. It's also a helpful way to maybe, it's also easier to get a line of credit than a term loan because a line of credit is based on how much money do you usually make? When does it usually come in? So let's just make a deal around that versus a term loan, which is like, what is your strategy for repaying this? Which is just kind of a little bit more complicated. So sometimes having a line of credit with a bank that you don't even have a term loan with can be a good way to build a relationship. Um, and lastly, kind of think of this maybe more like a credit card. When you get a line of credit, maybe you want a, a $50,000 line of credit for your cooperative. So whenever you want, you can draw up to $50,000 from that and then pay it down whenever you want to. You don't have to say what it's used for. You just kind of get it approved for the year. You know, you can take up to 50,000, you have to pay it back. The longer you have it out, the more you have it out, the more interest you pay. You know, if you have a dollar out for one day, it's almost no money. If you have a $50,000 out for three months, well, that's going to add up. So that's what a line of credit works. But it's kind of like a credit card in that, in that way um, where you get a limit approved and it has an interest rate and what you have, you know, during, during that, that period. Um, but, you know, the interest rate's better than a credit card. We're talking maybe 6 to 7% for a business line um, versus, you know, double digits plus for credit cards. All right, so good, maybe a good strategy to think about refinancing credit cards into a line of credit if you're getting burned by interest expense, possibly. All right, keep going. Talk about term loans. Uh, try to make this stuff exciting. I got no clip art, so I just got to try to do it. All right, so term loans, this is for a specific purpose, right? We're gonna, we're, we want to grow. We want to finance this big purchase. We want to refinance our existing debt of this amount. We want to restructure our company and we need $100,000 to get there. Sometimes you can use a term loan to build a little bit of credit history, but I think the line of credit's better for that. That's, that's why it's not in bold. But the thing to remember is a term loan's usually for a specific project and the idea is, I don't have the cash or don't want to take all the cash out of my account and pay for it all at once. I have a desire to pay it out over a period of time, right? And, and, and I like the fact that I don't have to spend all my cash at once. I'll pay an interest for that ability to pay it out over time. Um, term loans are usually fixed regular payments, you know, each month usually, could be each quarter, each year, but usually fixed monthly payments make it easier to plan around. Um, uh, and, you know, in talking about how long you get to pay a, a loan over, what is the term of it? Uh, right here, you know, maybe you could pay, pay a loan back. A lot of loans for businesses are between five and seven years because businesses kind of work on that time frame. If you bought a piece of equipment that you were going to use for 10 or 15 years, though, it might make sense to have a 10 or 15 year term from the lender. So you're always trying to match how long you pay it back by like the risk of the investment. The, the bank is, and, and most business loans are five to seven years. All right, so we're talking line of credits, like a credit card approved for an amount. You take it as you, as you need it. You pay it back when you can. You pay interest based on what you use. You get that approved for about a year at a time, and then you renew it each year versus a term loan where it's a specific loan. You get it approved. You get all the cash out. You spend it all out, and then you pay it back in fixed monthly payments over a set term. That's basically the only loans that I'm ever thinking about, you know, when I'm advising clients, you know, or working with borrowers around financing. All right, real quick, just a couple of little details on the end. Um, down payment requirements. So this is really specific for term loans. You know, let's say you want to grow, right? And it's going to cost you $100,000 to open up that new location. You know, you're going to pay some rent in advance. You're going to need staffing to start it up. You need marketing. You know, it's going to need $100,000. Um, to start it up. Maybe you're acquiring a company in, in that amount, in that amount too. So are you going to go to a bank and ask for a $100,000 loan? 
Well, maybe. And in the cooperative space, sometimes we can do that. But in the conventional lending space, that'd be really hard. That's called loan to value ratio. A bank usually doesn't want to loan 100% of the project that it's for. So if, if, if the company needs 100,000, the bank would love to say, how about you put in 50,000 out of your own pocket that you've saved up and I'll loan the other half instead of having the bank kind of take all of the risk for that. And you know, even the federal government SBA loans say the borrower needs to put down you know, probably about 20% of the total project cost. You know, and if it's a hundred thousand dollar project, that's twenty thousand dollars, and you know that could be pretty darn hard to split in a cooperative. You know, um, we're not talking about you know some rich person just owning the whole thing and being able to just to just do that. We're talking about ownership being spread out along a lot of people. It might not make sense to split that twenty thousand in any way. Um, CDFI lenders that you know we're all you know we all know know and love here um, that lend to the co-op space they're able to come down from that and maybe take five or 10% of a project, you know, in terms of uh, needing for, you know, what's that down payment, but there could still be a gap. And I think that's something that why the fund for jobs worth owning uh, kind of got involved here said, can we work with these existing lenders that, you know, if they can loan 80% of the project, that might be fantastic, right? That's really investing in the cooperative sector more than the conventional space would do, but there's still a 20% gap. Maybe the co-op comes up with 5%. Who does that 15%? Who, who owns that risk? Well, what the fund says is how about we do that 15% and use kind of our knowledge around technical assistance and consulting to kind of manage that risk of taking that, you know, complementary position where we subordinate our capital and maybe defer some payments. So we fill that gap, you know, that, that could exist when you're trying to come up with all the capital for the, the transaction. So just trying to connect that back to the fund and, and you know, why a loan to value ratio might, might come up and, and, and a gap might exist. All right, personal guarantees, very big scary thing with loans. You know, hopefully a lot of the co-op lenders that you're working with out there have found different products and solutions to not say, if things go south, I need your car and your house and your assets. I mean, that's what a personal guarantee is. It's a, a lien against somebody's possessions to say, if you can't pay the loan back, I need some, you know, stuff coming over to me to make me whole. So I'm going to need personal guarantees. And that's the big problem with co-ops accessing the SBA loans. You know, we got some great federal business loan programs out here, um, but they require full and unlimited personal guarantees from everyone investing. So, you know, that co-op goes to take out the hundred thousand dollar loan and all the employees are on the hook for a hundred thousand. That doesn't make sense. You know, so that that's the issue we got, you know, and, and that we're working in, and, and, you know, an NCBA and the whole team is working on a lot, you know, to find a way to make sense of the personal guarantees for cooperatives, because that, that solution, you know, doesn't make sense. Um, but personal guarantees are a tactic that's there, often for very small companies, you know, to, to, to keep folks at the table if things, you know, um, if things go bad. So, um, Personal guarantees, you can think of them as just a way to give a lender, you know, some assurance that on a bad Friday, nobody's, you know, everyone's not just going to leave and say it's, you know, the, the lender's problem uh, to kind of solve it. But you got to be super careful about these with cooperatives because, you know, 99 times out of 100, they don't make sense. And so this is where your lender needs to get creative with you and say, well, if you're not going to do guarantees, can we have technical assistance ongoing, you know, long term through the loan? You know, or can we have your community around you each put in, you know, can you raise 5,000 from the community or, or something to substitute for keeping everybody there? So this is the big thing in cooperative lending that you're always trying to dance around and come up with solutions that work for cooperatives instead of, you know, do whatever the existing programs do. All right. Maybe you want a loan. Maybe you're ready to grow. Maybe, you, you know, you don't want another year of not having a cushion in case you know, you have some more pandemic months or maybe now, you know, you need a line of credit because, you know, you're always waiting on that, you know, payment to come in and it's stressing you out and you'd love to just be able to click and draw down money for a day if you need to. All right. So let's apply for a loan. I just have a couple of slides here real quick before the Q&A on what might you need to apply for a loan. This section is not as big as the prior one. So don't worry about that. So you're ready for a loan. Um, for the last you know, five or six years, as Katrina mentioned, I'm working with companies, you know, looking for loans and talking with lenders and saying, you know, here, 
they have a project. How do we get some financing? The big thing I learned is don't spend a lot of time coming up with a big email, a big package, you know, figuring out every little detail before you talk to a, a bank or your investor. I think, you know, you want to be ready. You want to say, I kind of, you know, need this amount of money and we've looked at the numbers and it kinds of work, you know, and, and, and we can pay it back and here's what we need, but you don't need to be so specific. You know, um, it's, I, I think it's good to have a conversation with the lender, say, here's what we're interested in doing. You know, I want to learn about the financial products that you're offering. I want to learn what you're looking for in a successful borrower. And I want to learn what information you need from us to basically have the discussions you need to internally to see about if you want to work with us. And then when you actually apply to that bank, you're applying with full knowledge of what this person at the bank is looking for you to do. And they're waiting for your application because you have a conversation with them. So just, I would say, you know, have enough material together. So after a conversation with a bank, you could send a, a page, page and a half, you know, of like, here's what we want, but you don't need to have everything figured out. And actually you might get information from the lender that says like, this is what we need to figure out. I'm glad I didn't waste all my time on that. All right, but bare bones, we're talking a business plan, you know, along with your application. We're talking financial projections. Okay, you want this much money? How are you gonna pay it back? Do you have enough profit to pay it back? Do you think you will? That's what financial projections are. Um, and then cooperative contributions, that's the personal guarantee thing. I think we touched on that enough, but just know that's gonna come up too. If you know you're looking for a big loan to value ratio, you know, and personal guarantees are off the table. Do you have your technical assistance to support you? You know, do you have, you know, uh, good buy-in fees, good membership from your, you know, your, 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 uh, your cooperative owners, things like that. All right. So business plan, you know, the home care financial session is really probably a wealth of gold right now in terms of, you know, what Margaret Lund's talking about in home care financials and thinking of the cost structure and how many hours do you need each month in order to, you know, generate the profit you need and cover your costs. There's a lot of ways to do business planning. No one way. Um, the whole reason that you do a business plan really for a lender is just to make sure that someone has kind of thought about it all enough. Um, we're going to talk about sources and uses. This is just a term you might hear when applying you know, for a loan. It basically is like, how much money do you need? Where is that going to come from? And what is it going to be spent on? So I'll show you an easy example of that. And then the investment proposal is something that you're just kind of generating along. How much money are you seeking? What interest rate are you expecting to pay and have you budgeted for? You know, and if it's a term loan, over how many years do you think you can pay it back? So when you go to the bank, you kind of come, I'm looking for this much money and we can pay it back over this long at this interest rate. Can you do that? That's a really good way to get to a yes quickly. You know, instead of being like, well, what, what can you lend us? Which is a really bad way to get to a yes. <laughs> I heard something come in for a second. I don't know if that was a question, but maybe I'll check the chat. Yeah, it was just a quick, it was just a unmute mute situation. You should be good now. Okay, awesome. Um, and we can talk more about the, can I just saw a question there? We can get back to it at the end. All right, um, so let's quickly finish up this. Um, so now you know about that. This is sources and uses, not super complicated, but for me, when I was a consultant, I'd hear these, you know, technical terms and it just, it just confused me, you know, sources and uses. Do I have that? Okay, look, you have it. But this is what we're talking about here. How much money do you need? 100,000. Sources, where's it coming from? We're getting a loan from you for 95,000. We have 5,000 in the bank. Okay, that's 100,000. What is it being used for? Well, we're buying another agency, cost 75,000. That's the agreed upon price. We have $5,000 in legal costs. You know, and then we want 20,000 in the bank just to, just, you know, to, to subsidize a little bit, working capital. Okay, so you need 100,000. It's gonna come from these places and you're gonna spend it on that, great. You made the numbers equal. That's the test, right? It's simple, but that's just all that it is. Business planning, we talked about that a second ago. Tons of ways you can do business planning. I love canvases and PowerPoints, ways to not have 75 pages of stuff and just kind of get to the bullets of what we're talking about. Uh, remember, the whole thing with a business plan is just for, you know, usually a lender or an investor to make sure that the company has done enough planning and strategic thinking to be prepared for the venture ahead. It doesn't really matter what the business plan says. It's all an exercise in investment and thought. That's how I see it. 
uh, I talked about investment proposal before to just kind of maybe say what a specific example of that. You know, this is maybe how to phrase an investment proposal. And this is what you're trying to get to by, you know, doing your business planning, looking at your modeling, talking with the loan officer, over time getting to the place where I'm seeking $90,000, you know, to refinance our existing debt. Right now we're paying six and a half percent interest. We're okay with continuing to pay that, but we would like a couple months of interest only so we could build some cash. And we would like a term of five to maybe seven years would be best for us. You know, if I saw that as a lender, that really helps me meet you right where you are. You know, and it really helps me want to say, okay, they know what they need for financing. Let's give them seven years. Let's try to give them, you know, the much that they're asking for. I think this is how, what you're trying, you're trying to approach. And then following that up with some financial projections showing how you're paying back out that 90,000 payment starting six months from now, based on where you're at. I mean, if you can get to that point, the loan's basically, you know, around the corner. It's a lot of planning to kind of get to this point. So. A line of credit, the language just might be a little different. I'm seeking a revolving line of credit. It just means like once I use it, I can use it again, revolving with a $50,000 limit. That's how much I could borrow into. Why 50,000, the lending officer is gonna ask? Well, our average payroll is 25,000 a month and we wanna be able to, you know, have two payrolls in the line of credit just in case. Our, pay, our payments are really late. Okay, so that's why you want the $50,000 line. How many times are you gonna to wanna to draw it a year? Maybe four times a year, but we'd pay it down quarterly. We would never hold the balance for more than three months. Okay, that, that, that gets basically, if you can get to this point, you'll just accelerate your application to being ready to kind of being re reviewed by loan committee because it's very specific what you're asking for. All right, where, where does all this get you? You apply to a lender. Um, the lender is going to do some due diligence or underwriting, which are just fancy terms for seeing if they want to do the loan. You know, does, does the math check out? Does the strategy check out? Does it match with what the fund wants to do strategically as its own entity? You know, um, uh, if the answer is yes, the, the lender will probably interest you, uh, you know, a letter of interest. Um, or if they've done enough due diligence, you'll get a term sheet that says, hey, you know, we got a couple more conditions, but we'll commit to lending you at this interest rate, at this amount, if you can fulfill those conditions. Um, eventually, you know, you'll get in those last conditions fulfilled and you'll get your, you know, your uh, approval letter. Um, uh, and then you'll kind of just be in the phase of um, making sure the legal documents, the loan contracts have been reviewed by a lawyer. You'll sign them and then you'll schedule a closing date, um, uh, well, which is when the documents are signed and the money goes where it needs to go, maybe your bank account or to pay off somebody else or something like that. So you just might hear some terms like letter of interest, term sheet, commitment letter, as these kind of just different thresholds going up from the bank that ultimately just leads you to closing where the money comes out. All right. So let's just go into, you know, other questions right now. And, you know, sorry, I've only left about 20 minutes or so to do that. Hopefully we'll have some clarifying questions. Um, uh, if not, you know, I would love to hear just any challenges that you're kind of thinking about financing, getting a loan based on what you've heard today. But Avona, do you want to start us off with uh, anything about the question part? Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to start with a question from Terrell at HCA, just logistically, if these slides are going to be available. Um, I'm sure they are, as well as a recording on CDF's website, so um, I'm not sure if they'll be available immediately today, but sometime within the week, they should be able to pop up there. Um, and then just a question from Tara about, you know, is ICA recently doing CDFI loans? I know you saw that question, and I think it's maybe worth kind of, again, delineating the ICA in the fund and then kind of where does the fund sit in this CDFI world? Yeah, thanks. You know, I kind of smashed through there right in the beginning to get to the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but the fund for jobs worth owning is a supporting organization. What is this? I don't know what this is. I'm wary about doing anything with it. I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. So the fund for jobs worth owning is a supporting organization of the ICA group. Um, so it's affiliated with the ICA group, um, but we're our own entity. So, you know, we don't just do loans for the ICA group. We do loans um, working with partners and cooperatives, you know, around, around the country. Um, the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning is right now a business loan fund. Um, we would love to become a CDFI and we're working hard on that. That's a, you know, if you know about um, 
kind of social impact, social enterprise lending, that CDFI distinction is important, um, you know, to get. And it basically says, you know, you're a good actor in the space. So, you know, we'd love to be on a course for that one day. Um, but strategically, you know, as I said in the beginning, you know, there's a lot of um, CDFIs already, co-op focused CDFIs, um, you know, that have been in the space for, for a long time. And, you know, it would take me five minutes to, you know, rattle off the list, but, 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 but you know them. And these institutions, um, you know, have been leading the way and doing term loans and finding transactions for a while. So what we want to do is stand on their shoulders and say, if there's a situation where you're working on a transaction and there's a, a gap, you know, there's a loan to value ratio that the co-op has this amount, the, the bank is able to put in this amount and there's a gap that's left over, well, the fund can come in and be a solution for filling that, that gap. Um, you know, we envisioned ourselves as this kind of gap mezzanine is just the fancy word in the financing space, a mezzanine or gap loan fund to fill them, you know, when they exist. Um, but we're also okay, you know, and very interested in just providing advising and consulting for how you put together financing for a conversion or a home care yes. acquisition, you know, in the co-op space, given the uniqueness around the equity and personal guarantees and loan to value ratios, um, you know, and then if we're part of that solution that comes together, great. You know, and if we're not, that's okay. That's okay too. So we're working with the existing, you know, co-op lenders in the space that are doing a tremendous job and already getting capital out there. Great, thank you. Um, and then, you know, can you talk a little bit about how um, the fund is funded? You know, just kind of the originating um, capital. And then, if anybody, I believe there's a couple of people off of mute. If you could please mute yourself just to kind of um, minimize the background noise. Thanks, Alona. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's wild, but, you know, I, I, I had worked at the ICA group and I still work at both the ICA group and the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning, uh, both organizations. And, you know, in my time, we were always thinking about how to bring financial products to co-ops that were like what the, you know, cooperative needed, maybe it didn't already exist in the space, you know, that we had now. Um, and to, you know, to just build kind of this, as I mentioned, this complementary type of loan fund. And so that was the story five years ago. And eventually through the Candida Foundation, um, we found the seed capital to start the fund. So that was like uh, about a year to two years ago now um, is that, that, that we were awarded that, thankfully from, from Candida. So that gave, put us in the unique position to have some equity in our loan fund um, that we could build from. So we've done two loans some, uh, so far, the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning, um, kind of out of that equity base. And, you know, to demonstrate, you know, both to, in the home care uh, industry already. Um, and in addition, you know, as a loan fund, you can then use your equity to then take on investors and grow to be able to do um, uh, more and bigger loans. So we're very interested in doing that. Although we don't have uh, investors yet, we're actively building out the ability to do so, you know, a prospectus and other things. So, um, uh, you I'm know, sorry, Jonathan. I Andrea, can you please mute yourself? Sorry, that background noise is becoming really distracting. No problem. I think I got it in right at the end, but we are about to take on investors. We'll, you know, we'll probably announce when we're doing that. And the whole idea would be, you know, if there's a, a source of capital out there that would like to put money into this kind of gap mezzanine type of financing you know, then we're an organization that's going out and finding those transactions and finding the, um, uh, the businesses where it makes sense for us to be involved in and putting our capital there. Eventually we'll run out of the seed grant we got and we'll need to take on new investment, you know, to do that again. So that isn't the plan, uh, the plans for the future. Great, thank you. I'm um, just doing a quick time check. Um, and then could you just one more time talk about the loan to value? Yeah. So the loan to value ratio is when you're thinking about how much money you need. And, and let's just pick a number that is, you know, we're buying a company, it costs $50,000. Buying a company costs $50,000. And so we need $50,000 so we can close on that company. We can take over ownership of all the assets, the stock, and start integrating you know, the administrative structure, the culture, the caregivers into our home care co-op. We need that $50,000. Um, 
we're ready to grow. We've written the whole plan to grow. We see it coming together. Um, and again, it's going to take 50,000 to do it. So we go to a bank and then we say, well, we need $50,000. And the bank says, how much are you putting in? Are you asking us to do a hundred percent of the value that you're purchasing? So it's a $50,000. Are you asking us to put in 50,000 of the money you need or what? other capital sources are there? Are you putting in maybe 10,000 of your own money? So then that's like an 80-20 sort of split. So then the loan to value ratio would be 80% on the bank side, a $40,000 loan going into a $50,000 business acquisition. That would feel better for the bank. And if it was a conventional bank, the starting point just might be if you need a $50,000 loan, then you need to come up with 25,000 cooperative. You need to come up with $25,000 to do that because I might stop at a 50% loan to value ratio um, on the bank side. But it's something to, I think, keep in mind of because it is how a lender looks at the overall kind of riskiness you know, of a loan. Um, and one of the things that the Fund for Jobs Worth Owning can do is it can reduce the risk of those other champion you know, CDFI co-op lenders that I was mentioning before by saying, well, instead of you doing you know, 80% of a loan, what if you do 50 and we do 30, right? So both lenders have less risk now. Maybe the borrower still needs to come up with that last 20% because the most the system will do is 80, but we've kind of split that with, with the other lender. There's also a chance that you're working with a lender that says we can do 80% no more and the co-op can't do any, and so you need someone to see that for that last 20% and the fund or another gap financing loan fund could be. But the question is how much money do you need and what percentage of that is an individual lender comfortable with putting in their loan to value? Great. Um, I encourage everyone just to throw in your questions or that's kind of the end of what we have so far, but I do have some questions that I think would be helpful to ask you, Jonathan, for the audience, if that's okay. Yeah, so I think my first question really is just around if people are interested in working with the fund or are interested in referring a co-op to the fund to, for either, you know, financing or this, you know, consultative approach that you're talking about, kind of what are the first steps and what, what do you encourage people to do? Oh, sure. Um, Oh, I spend a lot of the day, Ivona, uh, as you know, talking to folks, and I love it, you know, about what they're working on, whether it's um, transitioning a business to employee ownership or putting together the resources to start up a home care co-op uh, or to start a group purchasing effort for a home care, you know, uh, system. Um, and so it's always a conversation. So, you know, my email is right down there. Uh, my phone number you'll be able to find around, you know, and um, a lot of ways to get in contact with us. So, you know, if you're interested in just, we might need some capital, where do we get started? You know, we're glad to have a conversation with you about that and kind of the one of the things we do provide advice and how do you get a loan package together in the co-op space. Um, and if, you know, you think you might might need a loan, you know, reaching out and start, uh, start, starting to talk with us about, you know, again, as we said, letting us know about your business plan, the financial projections, eventually talking enough so you know what the investment proposal or ask is, you know, that's just, uh, all going to happen through conversation. Now, specifically the funds, because we're not trying to, you know, take on 100% of the deal or, 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 or the big part of it. We're trying to complement, you know, uh, where our risk capital can be the most helpful. Um, it might be the case that another lender is calling us. And, th and that, that, hap that happens quite often. That says, we're working with a borrower. You know, we've approved a loan for this amount. They need more. We're not comfortable with going any higher. Maybe you'd work with them. And then we'll talk with, you know, the, the home care cooperative, the borrower, you know, about the other financing that they still need, and then think about whether it makes sense for the fund to invest in that, given, you know, the technical assistance and the industry strategy they're connected with and, and, every, and everything else. Um, but I think the big thing to just, you know, reiterate about it is that, you know, we're always open, you know, for conversations and sharing knowledge. It's sometimes so confusing to think about how to put capital together for cooperatives. Again, because ownership is kind of separated from money in cooperatives in a way that 
makes bankers heads explode and it's very tough to navigate. And so part of the reason why the fund exists is simply to provide solutions information wise in that space. So please, it's, it's definitely an open door to have any conversation, whether you become a borrower of the fund, you know, or not. We're happy to just point you along. Great. Um, there's no more questions in the chat, but I thought maybe we'd open the floor a little bit. Um, see if anybody wants to chime in with some questions just kind of off the top of your head. Um, and additionally, I'm sure Jonathan is available after the fact. And then while we're waiting for that, I just want to point out that um, Isabel shared the link to the survey for the end of the day in the chat box as well. And we'll include the one for the Zoom conference or for the Zoom link to go back to the main room as well. Great. Um, if there's no other questions, Jonathan, are you okay with ending a little bit earlier? Do we want to, do you want to share anything um, before we get off? Uh, certainly. Oh, hold on, never mind. <laughs> Margaret's asking a pretty interesting question, but I think you have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, and it, I don't know if we have enough time for this, but kind of what cost range do you find when acquiring new agencies? Oh, because we're all growth minded in this conversation, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, certainly valuation in uh, is a thing, and you know um, what home care agencies are you know kind of being bought and sold for. You know what multiple of profits they're being bought and sold for uh, is something that kind of moves with the market. Um, what are some things that I can kind of put across? Knowing the average profits of a business is one of the biggest and most important things for valuation. Once you kind of know what the average profits have been before taxes over the past couple of years, it's probably a multiple of like three to four times that, probably for most businesses that I'm just roughly talking about here. Now, bigger businesses, bigger companies, we're talking that make a uh, million dollars in profit a year or more, five or six or seven or eight times what their average profit is. Certainly big home care companies who have been able to figure out how to do everything they do and have a million bucks in the bank at the end of the year left over. They're going to be trading for much higher multiples of profit. But, you know, oftentimes, you know, most small businesses that in a year make a million, two million, three million of revenue. So now we're talking about, you know, a scale right there. Um, three times average profit four times average profit, you know, for a smaller one, two times, it's all sort of around there. And that just kind of works out because if you sort of modeled out, you know, um, the profits of a company, uh, just the company, not, you know, imagine that it grows a crazy amount or fundamentally transforms you can't really spend more than three or four times of its value over time and have anything left for the person that's taken it on, unless they have a strategy for making it grow even more. So that's sort of what limits it, how much money in the future and how much of it can you realistically give out over the next four or five years in that sale price that needs to get paid back and still have it be exciting to somebody who's buying it. But if you're thinking about what is a company worth, and you know, what is the average annual profit that it's had for the last couple of years that you're gonna get the most mileage out of that. And then it's just figuring out what number to multiply it by. But the hard work is what's the average profit of that company. You know, and I've owned a lot of things. There's more capital strategies we could talk about. Next year's conference, valuation multiples. This is fun. You know, it's just I know cool. I have so many thoughts <laughs> myself, but we won't get into it right now. Um, we'll just dream of the future. Um, really quickly too, and what are the typical profit margins that we see um, for home care agencies and um, for businesses that are kind of looking to grow? Well, this is bit, you know, uh, profitability is, is tough to come by in a lot of parts of the home care space. It really is, especially when we're talking about publicly funded programs because of the priorities that we have in this country. We need to put more money into that. But I think most businesses, when you're healthy, 
you got like at least a 5% profit margin. And when you're happy, you got above a 10% profit margin. Trouble is that's really hard to do in the home care space, you know, but if you're less than a 5% profit margin at the end of the year, what does that mean? It means you're tight. It means your rates go up by one, you know, you're, you're, you raise wages by 1%. Now you're at a 3% profit margin. Your rates go down by 2%. Now you're at a one. So if you're less than 5% at the end of the year for any industry, I think you're too tight. But a lot of the times it's over five to be okay, over 10 to be happy. And I, I think a lot of public pay home care companies struggle probably to even break even, even to make probably 1% because of the margins. But if we think about a private pay company, you know, maybe hitting 5% is realistic if you have the right caseload, you know, that you know what, you know, you have a profitable blend of, you know, clients and hour mixes and things like that. And I guess to get a 10% profit margin, you probably just need to be real big. I think there's some scale economies that once you probably turn $5 million a year, or $10 million a year in sales, that you can have the cost structure necessary to get a, to get that, you know, double digits. But, um, that's going to be super hard for m most companies to achieve in this industry. Right. Thank you. Um, and just we're at time. Um, and I think you talked about the private versus public well enough. So I think we'll go ahead and um, ask everybody to go ahead and go back to the Zoom link that's in um, the chat box. Again, Jonathan, there's so much great praise for you here and how great this presentation was. So I, I highly encourage you reading the chat box, but also just for myself, this was great and I really enjoyed it and I hope everybody else did as well. So thank you again. Um, and we will see everybody back in the other room. Thanks, Ivona. Thanks so thank much, everybody. Bye-bye.